Welcome everyone. My name is Jeremy Katz and I'm the Senior Director of Archives at the William Bremen Jewish Heritage Museum in Midtown Atlanta. Thank you so much for your interest in our Atlanta Jewish History Talk series presented by the Bremen Museum in partnership with the Southern Jewish Historical Society and generously sponsored by Marilyn Ginsburg Eckstein. Over the course of this six week period, we have been talking with uh, various topics related to Jewish life in Atlanta with experts in the field. Uh, so thank you for attending past events and I hope you can join us for the next second half of the series starting today. Um, this series was developed to help promote a new book on the history of Jewish Atlanta written by yours truly. Images of America, the Jewish community of Atlanta is available for sale and features 200 images that document the rich history of our community. The vast images uh, a vast majority of images featured in the book come from the archives at Freeman Museum and all authors royalties benefit the museum's operations. Uh, we'll be providing a link where you can purchase the book uh, as well as uh, links to the map projects that we're going to be talking about today by our distinguished speakers. It is my pleasure to welcome our speakers for today, Dr. Marty Davis and Dan Maslia, Associate Professor of History at Georgia State University Dr. Marnie Davis is a historian of ethno ethnicity and immigration in the United States. She is the author of Jews and Booze, Becoming American in the Age of Prohibition, which was a finalist for the Sammy Rohr Prize in Jewish Literature. Davis is currently researching and writing about ethnic neighborhoods in 20th century Atlanta and the relative impacts of redlining, urban renewal, and suburb suburbanization upon these neighborhoods. A native of Atlanta, uh, Dan Masley is the child of Sephardic Jewish immigrants from Izmir, Turkey. He is a lifelong member of Or Shalom Congregation and spearheaded their map, Founders Map Project, which we'll be displaying today, uh, an effort to geographically document the founding Sephardic community in Atlanta. Beyond his involvement at Or Shalom, Mr. Masley has served in volunteer leadership positions at the Jewish Federation of Greater Atlanta, the Atlanta Jewish Community Center, and the Jewish Family and, Jewish family and Career Services. Uh, the way the program is going to be structured is that I will pass it off to Dr. Davis, who uh, will then pass it off to Dan, and then we'll wrap it up with um, questions at the end. So, uh, Marty, please take it away. Okay, uh, thanks. I'm so delighted uh, to be here to talk about these mapping projects. And uh, Dan and I have actually been working together on our shared projects and shared interests for it must be a couple of years now. So this is especially fun uh, for me. And uh, so, yes, so here we have uh, the mapping project uh, that uh, I'll be talking about a little bit. So this is a website that I built about two years ago uh, about Georgia Avenue. And for those of you who know Atlanta, uh, fairly well. Uh, Georgia Avenue is uh, the street in sort of the south side of the city. It's about a mile south of the State House, and it's right where uh, it's at the northern edge of what used to be Turner Field and is now uh, Georgia State University's uh, football stadium. And I should say that uh, I'm, you know, I'm, a, I'm an academic historian, a trained historian, but I'm not a geographer. Uh, my interests in maps, I guess my, uh, the development of my, uh, my, I've become quite a map nerd. <laughs> and uh, that has so much to do with the kinds of resources that I discovered were available in doing this project and projects like it. So this is a history project um, that's organized around historical maps and uh, aerial photos of the area that uh, I'm going to be talking about a little bit today. These maps were all uh, created during the 20th century. Uh, uh, and uh, they show how this area surrounding Georgia Avenue and Georgia Avenue itself specifically have changed so dramatically over time from the beginning of the 20th century um, until today. And also, I think it's interesting to note that these maps all tell us lots of different kinds of information. I mean, if you look at the website, you'd see some of these maps are just talking about like the structures and what they're made of. Some of the maps are about the people and who lives in the neighborhood. And some of them really tell us about what the city thinks about the area and how to develop it, change it, uh, and during the era of things like urban renewal, uh, what to replace what was already there uh, with massive projects like highways and stadiums. 
So um, if you go down, uh, uh, Jeremy, to the next section, though the project is about Georgia Avenue, it really covers these two neighborhoods that existed side by side uh, next to each other. Uh, one is a neighborhood I refer to in this project as the South Side. Uh, though uh, it, some people called it uh, the Capitol Avenue, Washington Street. A lot of people that I've talked to in my interviews just referred to it as like the Jewish neighborhood in Atlanta because it was for much of the early up until like the mid 20th century, it was the most robust Jewish neighborhood in the city. It was where a lot of Jewish immigrants lived. It was for a while where all of Atlanta's uh, synagogues were and Jewish institutions were, and that's the yellow uh, section on this map to the uh, west. And then to the east is a neighborhood called Summerhill. And this neighborhood was one of the earliest black neighborhoods that was created uh, after uh, the emancipation of slaves and after the Civil War. And so these neighborhoods really existed very much side by side with each other and had interactions with each other, but they were regarded as entirely separate both by the city and by the people uh, who lived in these neighborhoods. And I know that from both the archives that I have studied, but also from the people that I have spoken to who grew up in both the South Side and in Summer Hill. Um, and if, uh, uh, Jeremy, if you go down to the next section called A Neighborhood in Decline. And so this is one of these historical maps. Uh, it was created in 1939. And as you can see, one of the you know, important differences in these two neighborhoods was race. And that had a lot to do with you know, what the, how that helped, that really determined what the city uh, thought of these neighborhoods uh, and how they were you know, planning to utilize them, what they thought about maybe, you know, class differences and poverty, how poverty was regarded in a white neighborhood versus a black neighborhood was seen really differently. Um, and you can see the little yellow line uh, that I've put there, that is Georgia Avenue. And so Georgia Avenue is, you know, an important part of this story. Uh, but of course, Georgia Avenue doesn't exist and can't flourish without all of the neighbors around it who are the patrons of the stores. Uh, that are along Georgia Avenue, this uh, sort of the main commercial district of these two neighborhoods. And Jeremy, if you'll go down to the to the next section. So, another thing that I did, yes, that I did in this uh, in this map was I created these little. They're called shape files, and these shape files are all associated with the buildings along Georgia Avenue. And if they're in white, they're surrounded by white. That means that that's one of the stores. And so you can see that if you click on them, you can see that there are lots of stores. And if you look at them, you'll notice that a lot of the storekeepers along Georgia Avenue were in fact uh, Jewish, that there were many who were uh, Jewish immigrants. Uh, there's a, a, a couple of uh, Sephardic Jews, as a matter of fact, who own the Georgia Avenue Grill. <laughs> um, and uh, so and, and actually maybe this is a good opportunity to go down to uh, the next uh, section about, uh, yes, the immigrant entrepreneurs. So I do write, you know, extensively here about the, um, you know, some of the, the uh, Jewish families, uh, and also not only Jewish families, uh, but also Greek families and Syrian families uh, that uh, owned and ran stores along Georgia Avenue. So Georgia Avenue actually was a, a really important site uh, for uh, economic mobility for a lot of immigrants. And one of the things that I did was uh, I interviewed uh, quite a few of the, uh, uh, or the several uh, people, the children of uh, these entrepreneurs. And so here's one of the interviews and uh, I asked uh, Jeremy if we could play maybe about 30 seconds of this one. So this is with Jack Rosenberg. Uh, and uh, Jack's father owned a little, what he refers to as a, a confectionery store. Confectionery. And I always wonder what that means. Yeah. Well, I, I consider <laughs> it as a predecessor to 7-Eleven. It didn't have a filling station, but it had bread, milk, and ice cream, and, and, and tobacco, and chewing tobacco, and cigars, and, uh, and uh, maybe a couple of cans of, of milk or something. Just basic essentials that the clientele there would, would want, not, not large groceries or no, nothing large, everything was small, hand-dipped ice cream, sold cigarettes for a penny a piece. They never bought a pack. They come in and want a cigarette, give, they give you a penny. Thanks. 
That's right. the back. Snuff. So there are interviews uh, throughout this project with uh, several uh, with uh, uh, people who grew up in the Jewish communities uh, in the South Side. Also, uh, many of uh, African Americans who grew up in Summerhill. Uh, one uh, African American uh, who grew up on the South Side, as a matter of fact, uh, a man. Maybe those of you who are big Braves fans might know Walter Banks, uh, who was a uh, you know. A, a, sort of a, a mainstay of the Braves organization for decades and decades. And when he was a kid, he started working at the Atlanta Fulton County Stadium back when that's where the Braves played. Um, and then he moved to Turner Field. And I think that he is still working for them, you know, decades later uh, up in Cobb County. Um, and if you'll uh, go down, down to the uh, last little section that I, I wanted us to look at, this one, yes. So uh, the real sort of the longer story of this neighborhood and the story that I thought it was particularly important to tell was uh, the story of, of sort of the, the destruction of these neighborhoods uh, by uh, efforts to create you know, modern facilities for the city. Things like, as you can see in this photograph, this is from 1965, uh, 64, um, as the Atlanta Fulton County Stadium is being built. Uh, and uh, Georgia Avenue is just along the bottom and you can see already that so many of the buildings have been taken out, but all of this area um, above Georgia Avenue where the stadium is now, where the, uh, the knot of interchange is now, uh, this it was all the, the Jewish neighborhood. I mean, it wasn't only Jews who lived there, but this was between Capitol Avenue and Washington Street and just to the west of Washington Street too. This was where all of the, you know, the synagogues were, most of the synagogues were where the interchange is now and it's just gone. And so one of the reasons that I wanted to do this project in the first place is because it seemed like so many people just didn't know that this had been a neighborhood and a really, you know, a flourishing and robust neighborhood with people of lots of different backgrounds, of lots of different class backgrounds, racial backgrounds, ethnic backgrounds, filled with stores and institutions like Piedmont Hospital, and not to mention all the Jewish institutions and the Greek church was there, which had previously been the temple, uh, and uh, so many families and so many homes gone. And so there's kind of this hidden history <laughs> that I felt was really important to uh, exhume about this neighborhood, especially at this particular moment, while the uh, the uh, the neighborhood is currently being uh, sort of gentrified and redeveloped, uh, and often with a sense of that, well, there was nothing there; it was all parking lots, and now we're going to put something there, and isn't that great? But before there was nothing there, there was something, and we've forgotten. <laughs> Uh, and so my goal for this website is to help us remember what had been forgotten in the built environment of our city. Uh, so I think at this point, I wanna, I wanna throw uh, to Dan uh, so that he can talk about his, oh, oh, that's right. Oh, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about one of my uh, favorite, uh, uh, the sources that I use. So this is when I was talking about historical maps and how I've become a map nerd. This is one of my favorite kinds of sources. This is a Sanborn map. And the Sanborn maps, if you've never heard of them, uh, they were fire insurance maps that were created in order for insurance companies to develop um, fire insurance policies. And so if you look at these maps, they have so much information. They're incredibly detailed. So you can see if you look at them uh, you know, very, very closely, you can, it'll tell you how many stories a building is. It'll often tell you if the building is made of, you know, different kinds of material. Uh, it'll tell you where there are, uh, uh, you know, water pipes uh, in case, you know, there's a fire and you want to know if it's close to, uh, you know, uh, some kind, some source of water. But this is the map of uh, where the Jewish Educational Alliance had been, and this is on Capitol Avenue, which today is um, Hank Aaron <laughs> um, uh, Avenue, Hank Aaron Boulevard. Uh, and it's between uh, Fair Street, which is now Memorial, and Woodward Avenue. Uh, and that, now if you go to that, if you like are put in that particular place, you'll be in the middle of the highway interchange. So it's no place now. But it used to be one of the most important 
uh, institutions for Jewish life for uh, Germans, Eastern Europeans, uh, the Sephardic Jews, uh, all Jews of all different uh, you know, class backgrounds, and pr pretty much everyone that I've spoken to who grew up in the in middle of the 20th century in Atlanta talked a lot about the time that they had spent, the importance of the Jewish Educational Alliance for the development of Jewish community and the maintenance of Jewish community in this neighborhood. But I think that another thing that's worth looking at here is, so Capitol Avenue was, you know, a very important sort of a main thoroughfare. There were uh, people of all different backgrounds, primarily white people uh, lived uh, along Capitol Avenue. There were a lot of stores. It was also a very commercial uh, thoroughfare. But if you just go one block east to Fraser Street, Fraser Street is one of the most important commercial thoroughfares and residential areas uh, for the for Summer Hills uh, African American community. And you can see some of the differences in the structures and you don't even have to look that closely that the homes that uh, are along Capitol Avenue uh, and you know elsewhere Woodward Avenue was primarily white that these homes are a lot bigger uh, that there's the lots are a lot bigger uh, and along Fraser Street they're a lot smaller and people are living in very you know very narrow duplexes sometimes living in the backs of neighborhoods and so these maps in combination with a resource that uh, Dan is going to tell you more about called the city directories, you really get a sense not just of the built what the built environment looked like back, you know, 50 years ago, 100 years ago, built environment that's been totally destroyed. You don't really only get a sense of what those structures looked like, but also the people, you know, who was there. <laughs> and uh, what was, and then that sort of gives you a snapshot with which you can start to try and understand, like, how did people understand each other? How did they live in, together while also obviously in a Jim Crow city living apart? So uh, I will leave it at that. Uh, and uh, Dan, uh, why don't you uh, say a little bit about the city directories? I think that's where you're going to go first, right? Yeah. It's nice being with you again. It's also nice being able to talk about growing up in the south side of Atlanta in the 30s and 40s, and also to talk about my second family, Congregation Over Shalom. So as they say, let's start from the very beginning, the beginning being the year of the Spanish Inquisition in 1492. You know, for several hundred years before the Inquisition, the Sephardic Jews lived peacefully with the Christians and Muslims in the Iberian Peninsula. But in 1492, being ordered to convert to Catholicism or be killed, thousands of Jews, Jews fled Spain. And hearing of their plight and having a desire to populate the Ottoman Empire with the Jewish intelligentsia from Spain, Sultan Bayezid literally sent ships to Spain to rescue the thousands of Sephardics who then settled in Turkey on the island of Rhodes and in some of the other Ottoman countries uh, Egypt, Bulgaria, Hungary, Macedonia, Romania, and Jordan. They were able to save thousands of Jewish lives just by bringing them into the Ottoman Empire. For four, over 400 years, while living in Turkey and Rhodes, the Sephardic spoke a language, Ladino, which is an archaic form of Castilian Spanish with Hebrew words, along with Arabic, Turkish, Greek, French, and Italian words. And when they immigrated to Atlanta, they brought this language with them. And growing up in my household with Italian, with immigrants and grandparents exposed me to the language. And I can still speak Ladino uh, today, although haltingly. Uh, seeking a better life, many Sephardics left for the United States in the early 1900s. And in 1906, two men, Ezra Turiel and Victor Zardell, were the first Sephardics to immigrate to Atlanta. Others followed, and in 1910, a group of about 40 families, primarily from the Isle of Rhodes, formed a Sephardic synagogue named Ahadat Shalom. Not surprisingly, in 1912, about 20, 25 disenchanted Turkish families withdrew and formed their own synagogue called Or Hayim. Sanity finally prevailed. And in 1914, the two congregations merged 
into congregation or Rick Shalom, which oh, after 100 years, we are still a vibrant and progressive synagogue. And by 1935, Orbe Shalom consisted of about 425 members from about 135 families, roughly half from Turkey and the other half from Rhodes. The struggling uh, immigrants began to open their own businesses with shoemaking being the most popular. A trip downtown during the 1910, during the years from the 1910 to the late forties would reveal Sephardic operated shoe shops servicing the entire downtown area. One shop, Benny Shoes, opened in downtown Atlanta by Mr. Benny Shumari, who I knew very well, and is still in existence on Piedmont Road, now being operated by his grandchildren. And other businesses that, that uh, we got involved in were restaurants and grocery stores. The Sephardic immigrants naturally found housing on the south side, as, as Marnie mentioned, primarily on Prior Street and Central Avenue, where other Jewish families resided. Very likely, at least 75% of the residents on Prior Street and Central Avenue from Memorial Drive to Georgia Avenue were Sephardics. And probably the Greek community occupied most of the remaining 25%. Warm evenings on Central Avenue and Fire Street by the Sephardic families were sitting on porches, listening to the radio, and communicating with other neighbors who were also on their porch. Whenever my mother would bake barekas or other delicacies, she would follow Sephardic tradition and have me take a few to our neighbors as all of our neighbors did for us. It was one big happy family. And as Marnie mentioned, Georgia Avenue was a pivotal place and shopping on Georgia Avenue for our families was a weekly ritual. The area offered a wide selection, as Marnie mentioned, of Dallas, a and P, Piggly Wiggly, pharmacies, and the old Manhattan Bakery, which moved eventually to Cheshire Bridge Road and uh, is, now, is now closed. The fun day for us was, was on Saturdays as kids. It was very special. For, for nine cents, we would go to the Empire Theater, Empire Movie Theater, and watch the double feature, the cartoon, and usually twice, while eating barrecas and feta cheese and other foods brought from home. The odor around us in the theater was something else, especially when we ate pickle herring. But it was not until 1940s as lives improved, that movement to the north side began. Many members moved to the Virginia Highland Lenox Road area, followed by some of the younger members who moved into the Brockcliff La Vista area. Several years ago, my son Martin gave me a copy of a 1928 United States Coastal Geodetic Map. This survey included the streets are located in the areas bounded by Memorial Drive, Prior Street, Georgia Avenue, and Capitol Avenue, which as Marnie mentioned is now Hank Avery Drive. It also outlined the structures on each lot, being the former land of Fulton County Stadium and, and Turner Field. And as I looked at that survey, I was able to find the houses that my family lived on Prior Street and Central Avenue during the 1930s and 40s. You know, it occurred to me that it would be a neat project to identify these houses that the OBS members lived in when they first arrived. I first spoke of the project with my late friend, Ralph Tarika, who had lived on Prior Street with his family that immigrated to Atlanta from Rhodes. He immediately began to assist me in identifying the residents. Then we realized we could only remember a, a small number of residents and that a more detailed search would be required. The solution was to utilize the City of Atlanta directory at the Bremen Museum and at the, at the uh, Atlanta History Center to identify the Sephardic residents living on those streets and in which years. Initially, our plan was to identify only the residences but we later decided to identify as well as the businesses in the areas. Together with my wife, Mimi, this two-year project began. We selected streets where homes and business would be identified. 
we selected Capitol Avenue, Central Avenue, Georgia Avenue, Price Street, Fulham Street, Washington Street, and Woodward Avenue. We picked the years 1918 to 1941 for our research. And in the city directory for each of these 20 years, we located these streets that, and the residents' names and their street number that they lived in. I then photographed each one of these pages and emailed them to myself. Now, being familiar with the names, it was easy for me to recognize them in the directory. I then created an Excel spreadsheet for each street and entered the name and address of each person living on that street, as well as a year as their residence. And this, Jeremy has just put up the, uh, this, no, the first, we go back to the, uh, yeah, this is one of the pages for, uh, from 1929 of, of Prior Street. And if you see down uh, around, coming down a little bit, that's where my mother and father lived with my grandfather, uh, Albert Abraham Corn, and uh, my, my dad. This was in 1929 where we lived. And on the street, you could see there are a lot of Jewish names. And coming down, you can see Chris Carlos. This is the father of Michael Carlos, who built, built the uh, Emory Carlos Museum in Emory. And then further down, you'll see Victor Bonetta. This is the father of Josiah Bonetta, my scout master 75 years ago, who just celebrated his 99th, 99th birthday. So you can see this is the pages we use to locate the streets and the addresses where everyone lived. We ended up with about uh, 160, 160 pages. Then after we identified all of these people on all these streets, we put a, did the Excel spreadsheet where I put the name of the person, if you see on the first line, Victor Barron, and he lived at 550 Prior Street and the year he lived in was 1933. So we had the names of all of our members who lived on these streets and in what year. If you see the last column where it's got map number, that number, when we'll show you the map in a moment, if you look at number 54, if you go to Prior Street and see number 54 written there, you'll know that that's where Mr. Victor Barron lived. Trying to um, make it even more clearer for people to know where everybody lived, we decided to do an alpha list. So we took uh, the, the data from all of this, this part here, and then we created an alpha list for each member. So you could see, for example, Eli Bihar uh, and uh, where he lived and the years that he lived in. And we also were able to put chronologically, he lived in 1919 and then the next house was on Woodward Avenue in 1921, and then Prior Street. And he moved around seven times. People used to ask me, why did y'all move around so much? I said, well, you know, things were pretty bad. So we had to move every time the rent came due. But that, that's, that's really not, I just thought I'd throw that in. But it was an interesting project to be able to locate where all these people live. Then after that, uh, uh, we included all of these pages into a book. Uh, this is a book that, that we created which shows basically the, the pictures of the three synagogues that, that we had. And the first one is a drawing of Orla Shalom on Central Avenue and Woodward Avenue. And we were there in 1924. Uh, then we moved to Highland and, and uh, Lanier Place in 1948. And then in 1971, we moved to our present location at uh, North Druid Hills Road. Then, uh, the book was uh, about 40 pages that, that, has, that has all this information in. And I have to be, give thanks to my daughter, Deborah, who really helped, helped us tremendously with the layout, and Adam Kofinas, the executive director at Congregation Over Shalom, uh, who helped us with the production. And in the book, the uh, contents were, we had the original uh, origin and development, how we started this book, and then the excerpts from a book. Saul Beton wrote a terrific book on the history of Orbe Shalom. And I took excerpts from his book and included it in our book. And then of course the residents you just saw and the uh, alphabetical listings. And then we listed the uh, uh, 1934 census uh, of, of the Orbe Shalom synagogue. Then after we finished all of this, and it took uh, quite a bit of time, 
we, uh, we wrote down all of the uh, numbers of the houses on this original map that, uh, that we created uh, that showed the uh, first map. Now this was the original map that we created. If you'll notice the numbers written in, if you look, those numbers, if you look at like number 50 on Prior Street and go back to the book, you'll show who lived on, on, on Prior Street. Or if you went back to the alphabetized side and asked who lived where, you would be able to identify these. Now, when we finished this map, it was crude and we felt that we wanted to do something to, to professionalize it. Well, there's a company in, in Lawrenceville, Tara Materials, founded by Johnny Benada, who is the son of Isaac Benada, one of the founding members of Obed Shalom. So Mimi and I uh, called Michael Benada, who's the CEO, and, and said we'd like to meet with him. So we took, we took this map uh, with us and uh, showed it to him. And we said, maybe you can kind of jazz it up for us. So Michael called in a couple of people from his art department and they looked over it and talked about it. And Michael said, well, let's see, we can do something to improve it. So <clears throat> going back and forth for about three or four weeks, we were uh, working with them. And uh, finally, they uh, ended up with uh, the professional final map that we have, which uh, is here. This was the map, but it, it uh, put in all the numbers. Uh, and the, there are two different colors of numbers. The blue numbers show the residences and the red numbers showed the businesses and the non-residential structures in this area, starting at Prior Street uh, go, from Memorial Drive, Prior Street, going all the way down to Georgia Avenue, uh, down to Capitol Avenue and back up Memorial Drive. And some of the highlights of some of the places if you'll notice, uh, the Jewish Progressive Club was, was listed there in 1916. It was on Prior Street. And the, it, it later on moved to Techwood Drive, uh, where Turner Broadcasting is. And then going further up Prior Street, you see where the Hebrew Benevolent Temple was. The temple was located on, on, on Prior and Richardson Street. They later moved to where they are now on on Peachtree and Spring Street. Coming back down to Central Avenue, Congregation Obey Shalom was located on the corner of Central Avenue and Woodward Avenue. And we were there, as I said, uh, from 1924 until 1948. And then coming down towards Washington Street, Washington Street and Pulliam Street, uh, as Marty mentioned, is no longer there. They're part of the downtown connector of I-75 and, and I-85. But on the corner of Woodward Avenue and uh, Washington Street, you see what, that's where the Standard Club was in uh, 1922. <clears throat> and across the street, the Avatahim Synagogue was, was there. They were there until about 1959 when they moved to the present location on Peachtree Battle. Going further up Washington Street was the Sheriff Israel Synagogue, which was built in 1928. And they are they moved from there to uh, to university is where they are now, and then of course there's the Atlanta Fulton County Stadium, and further down is as Marnie mentioned Turnerfield is now the uh, Georgia State uh, University School. Uh, if you'll notice the Hebrew Orphans Home is there too. Uh, the Hebrew Orphans Home was built in, in 1989. Actually, uh, several the Bene Barith Lodge wanted to build an orphan home in the South and they built it in Atlanta. And they had like 400 children there, uh, Jewish orphans uh, from that period 1809 until 1930 when it closed. And then it became the Jew Jewish Children's Services where they use their resources for uh, foster children as well as education. And then in 1988, it, cha it changed its name to the Jewish Education Loan Fund, JELF, which we all know today is, is, still, in, is still in existence and is, ma makes college loans to, uh, uh, to needy children, needy students. Uh, this map has uh, been a very interesting project for us and certainly for people in our synagogue. And if anyone is interested in viewing it, it can be viewed at the Bremen Museum anytime, and also it's part of the permanent display at the Atlanta, Atlanta History Center.
been nice talking about this and uh, great project. We enjoyed it. Thank you. And I also appreciate the help I got from, from Marnie and, uh, and Jeremy during this process. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dan and Marnie. A amazing map projects that you all have undertaken to highlight um, the Jewish community and, and other ethnic communities in Atlanta that, um, you know, it's, it's so easy to forget that Atlanta was once this small mountain railroad town, um, it, now that it's this big international city. So um, thank you for shining a light on this for all too often forgot history. Uh, we've gotten a lot of questions in uh, and lots of praise for you, both of you for, uh, like I just mentioned, uh, these really, really cool uh, map projects. Um, I'm gonna just kind of go through them as, as they came in. Um, so uh, one of the questions we got was about the motivation for choosing this area for the stadiums. Um, you know, how much uh, does that have to do with the fact that it was displacing these kind of uh, less empowered communities? I would say that it had everything to do with it. Uh, this is during the era of um, urban renewal and also the beginning of the public housing, uh, development of public housing throughout the United States. And as a matter of fact, Atlanta was the very first city in the United States to develop public housing projects. Uh, and of course they were uh, segregated. They built public housing for uh, white people and public housing uh, for African-Americans. Uh, but this whole area uh, at, uh, in starting really around the time of uh, the New Deal as the federal government is trying to develop programs for redeveloping cities that are in serious crisis, economic crisis. They're trying to figure out what to do about neighborhoods that are regarded as in decline. Uh, generally speaking, uh, American cities throughout uh, the, the country decide that the neighborhoods that are in most need of renewal, and by renewal that often means total destruction and either uh, relocating the residents, all usually relocating the residents altogether, that most of those neighborhoods that are seen as sort of problematic are either entirely African-American or mixed race. So if a neighborhoods where uh, black and white people live close to each other or neighborhoods where ethnic communities, immigrant communities live. So I would say that that has everything to do with why uh, the South Side neighborhoods were regarded as, you know, a, a, a reasonable place to sort of tear down to build first the highways because the city decided it needed to build highways in order to connect the city to the growing suburbs. And then after the South Side neighborhood had been destroyed in the 1950s, the original goal had been to build uh, public housing for white people in that very same place, like around where Piedmont Hospital is now, was actually then, and where Fulton County Stadium was built. So it was supposed to be public housing for white people, but African-American leaders went to the city and said, this is uh, unfair because it's actually black people who are more likely to be displaced by all of these projects and new housing isn't being made available to us. And we are in a serious moment of housing crisis for African-Americans in Atlanta. And so it's decided that then instead, okay, we'll build public housing there for African-Americans. But then uh, the, uh, the, the sort of the business leader community in downtown says, we actually don't want uh, black public housing so close to downtown because that will lower the property values in the area surrounding. There's just the general, uh, you know, sort of a, a, a general consensus among white people that it was bad to have black people living nearby to a, a downtown business area. So they couldn't build public housing for white people or black people. And this is when uh, Mayor Ivan Allen decides we'll build a stadium because we need a major league baseball team in order to be, you know, a first class city. And that's when he entices the Milwaukee Braves to decamp from Wisconsin and come to Atlanta. And that's why the stadium was built there. It wasn't like a one moment's decision. It took about 30 years for that decision to come to fruition. But in the end, I would say that it really, more than anything else, had everything to do with race. A quick follow-up to that. Um, was there any type of reaction from the community 
about the uh, demolition of historic homes and businesses in this area at the time, or has it been more, you know, uh, retrospective uh, look at this demolition? Well, I, I mean, I'd be curious to hear from Dan about this too, because I mean, he, he lived through it. My understanding is that by the time of the, uh, when the, certainly when the stadium and the highways are all being built, so many of the, not just the Jewish communities, but also uh, Greeks and Syrians had, uh, and all other sort of uh, native born whites had moved away from, were starting to move away from the South side. And from what I've read from like synagogue records, uh, synagogue leadership is already saying like, we, we got to get out of here. <laughs> we're, you know, the temples already moved to the North and one by one, they start build, you know, buying property, in, you know, around Virginia Highlands or even further to the North. Uh, and so by the time say Washington street is being really, you know, sort of mowed down <laughs> and all of the buildings, these beautiful Victorians are being dismantled. Uh, most of the uh, white people and uh, the immigrants who had lived here are already, they're facing north, which is really sort of like the Atlanta story <laughs> is to, you know, look to the north and develop to the north of the city uh, and leave what's south behind. Yeah, I'm curious, Dan, um, since you you have such a, a personal experience with this history, um, do you have anything to share about the move from the south side to the north side, and, and this this change in uh, the demography uh, demographics of the community. Well, it's what Marnie said, uh, and as I mentioned, that starting the mid to the late forties, uh, the Sephardic groups uh, started to, to move to the north side, and uh, by 1948, that's when the Orbe Shalom uh, moved uh, from Central Avenue and Woodward Avenue, mainly because a uh, larger percentage of the members had already located to the, to the north side and wanted to, to move the synagogue as well. And that's what happened. And we have a couple other questions about this uh, close relationship or at least um, mm -hmm. geography between the Jewish community and the black community of Fraser Avenue and I think it was Capitol or Central. Um, and and the not just the style of the houses on Fraser Avenue in terms of what were those shotgun style houses that there were a lot of shotguns. Yes, shotguns yeah. and shotgun duplexes. Very, very small, like three room, four room houses, often without indoor plumbing. Uh, was there any uh, intermarriage or uh, close relations between the Jewish community and the black community since there was this close geography between the two? I don't uh, remember any, any of that. Yeah. In my research, I, I mean, certainly, you know, the communities recognized each other. <laughs> um, and the certain, I would say that the, the, you know, the Jewish community, uh, which, you know, was under its own set of pressures. This is only, you know, this is within a generation of the lynching of Leo Frank. And, you know, this, the, the Ku Klux Klan has real power <laughs> in the city throughout the 1920s. And so, you know, the, the, it's understandable that, you know, the ethnic communities would sort of turn inward and seek to, you know, uh, you know develop some uh, self-sufficiency uh, and self-protection. Uh, so, but I mean, Jews uh, were also uh, regarded as white uh, by the, you know, by the, in the, you know, the racial spectrum of, of Atlanta and in the South. And so Jews had access to more resources, uh, things like, you know, uh, mortgages, <laughs> the ability to buy property almost anywhere they wanted. I mean, they were also, you know, limited by restrictive covenants in some parts of the city, uh, but th they could go to school, they could send their children to school wherever they wanted. And so that made a huge difference in, among these two groups. Uh, I would say that the relation, when those relationships between uh, African Americans and uh, Jews of European descent, when they were good, they were usually like employer employee relationships. And I have heard uh, both, uh, you know, uh, stories of real affection and care and uh, support uh, from both sides. And I've also heard, you know, much less pleasant stories. I've heard stories of uh, Black and Jewish children. Uh, usually boys, uh, like playing baseball together, but it seems like once they hit about sixth grade, that stops. Jeremy, I uh, didn't mention um, this map. If you look at the map, if, if you look at streets, uh, 
Central Avenue and Pryor Street, in back of these two streets, they had alleyways where African Americans lived in these alleyways and they had sh more like shacks than anything else. And as a matter of fact, this, the house we lived in at 475 Central near Alice, in the back of our house was an old shack that we used uh, for storage, but that's where African Americans lived in the late 1800s and, and the early 1900s. And then of course, you see these dotted lines between these streets, those were literally alleys that uh, you could get on from side streets. And there were, there were shacks that, that, uh, that they lived in uh, uh, much sooner than, than we lived there, probably in the late 1800s, or early 1900s. I have heard uh, stories about people, about African-Americans living in those sort of backyard shacks uh, up until the 1940s, maybe even a little bit later. Uh, and often those people, uh, the black people living in the, sort of on the property of, of uh, white Atlantans and often Jewish Atlantans would be employed by that family. Uh, sometimes to take care of children. Uh, I've heard about like a couple who, you know, the, the, the woman of the couple was a cook for a Jewish family and the man of the couple sort of did odd jobs and sometimes drove people around, drove the family around. Uh, so the even if those relationships were warm, <laughs> they were definitely uh, deeply unequal. And I've gotten a couple of questions about the the two previous buildings of Congregation Orba Shalom. Uh, can you go into a little bit more detail about them? Well, the first one was on Central and Woodward, it was actually a, a house, a two-story house that we purchased in uh, 1919, 1918. And uh, they converted the upstairs of the house to, uh, the, to the sanctuary and the downstairs was classrooms. And we were there until 48. And then we bought, I think it was the Hey Good Methodist Church building, which was on the corner of Highland Avenue and, and Lanier Place. And we moved there in, in 1948. And, uh, stayed there until 1971 where we moved into our present location, which is on North Druid Hills Road, a little across the street from uh, Cross Keys High School. And those are the only three places we, uh, we are. And Dan, there's never been a photograph located of the original building, right? I'm like, I'm desperate for a photograph. Well, I'm desperate too. Uh, <laughs> I've, I've spent more time looking for a picture than you can imagine. But I, the reason I don't think there is one because when Saul Beaton did his book, uh, I showed you the picture uh, of the, the yeah. synagogue, Saul being the artist. Well, he, he literally drew this uh, picture of, of this, and, and this is exactly the way it looked. I remember going there in the 30s, uh, but there, there's no picture. This was just Saul's drawing, the only thing we have. Uh, has anybody done a map project similar to Dan's or, or yours, Marnie, about specifically about the um, um, entire Jewish community? I know that be, would be a massive, probably a massive undertaking because you're talking about these other congregations, the temple and AA, um, but is that something that's on the horizon or is that something somebody has taken a stab at? Jeremy, when I started this project, uh, Leon may be watching, Leon Tuck, I called Leon Tuck and we got together and I told him what I wanted to do uh, in this area, these, these streets, I wanted to do the entire Jewish community that lived there. Uh, I mean, you know, you can look at these uh, uh, directory lists and you can tell, you know, the Jewish names. And uh, Lee and I talked about it, but the more I looked at it, th this would be a massive job. Uh, it, it was massive enough just to get the Sephardics, but uh, the, uh, to get all the Jewish people uh, living in, it would, would take, uh, it could be done, but it, it would take a long time. It can be. I mean, I, I don't plan to do anything like that, but I would encourage uh, anybody in the audience who, if you're watching this and you're thinking like, this is fascinating and uh, I'm, I need a new pandemic project. This is, you know, it's time consuming, but it's not hard to do. And the resources are all available to you. And uh, it's, uh, it's really fun. It's really fun to exhume this hidden history. And, and it, I mean, for me, it's totally changed the way I, I live in Grant Park, which is not far from Summerhill and you know the, the stadium areas. And I so I go walking around there all the time and it it kind of blows my mind to imagine I know so much more about what was there and who was there and to think about the, you know, how it's changed and what's different and what's not different. <laughs> is, um, is a really like a, a life enriching experience. 
Yeah, I have to agree. It's exhilarating when you finish a project like we did. It it was two years, you know, off and on, but uh, it's it's a good feeling, and I'd like to see it done, perhaps the whole Jewish community in, in the South Side. But, you know. Since this community was so close together, what was their interactions between the Sephardic community, the Ashkenazi community, even the Greek community down there um, in that community? And um, uh, and it, talking about like how it, because there's a, such as the division that later, probably, you know, took place in the community where the inter dating was almost seen as like intermarriage between the a Jew and a non-Jew almost when you had this interaction between these two communities it was that divided um can you talk about what the community was like back then though was it divided or was there a, a interaction between the these communities I think it was more divided than there was interaction the the Sephardics you know that they, they were came together they they were like a big family and they stayed together pretty much it didn't mingle much really you looked at uh, Central and Fire Street uh, the majority was Sephardics, and then on Capitol Avenue and Washington Street, that's where the majority of Ashkenazim uh, lived, and there really wasn't uh, a lot of uh, commingling. In fact, I remember uh, hearing uh, back in the early 30s when a Sephardic uh, man uh, married an Ashkenazi woman, and they were practically both ostracized because, I mean, you just didn't do that. Now, this is some 19, early 19, 1920 thinking that uh, they just did, did not, but eventually, you know, things uh, started to change and then there began to be more co-mingling between the Sephardics and the Ashkenazi. Marty, do you have anything to add? No, I mean, I, I would leave that to Dan where, I mean, th this, is a, this is a history that he experienced and would have seen happening. So I'll leave it to him. I want to talk about this exodus from, you know, being in the heart of Atlanta to Virginia Highlands, Morningside. Um, I'm gonna share this map that we have. This is a population study that was conducted by the Federation in 1946. And you can start to see this exodus. You have the, the, the remnants of this old community. So if you're familiar with Atlanta, this is Grant Park. So this is that, that community, uh, Georgia Avenue and that community that Marnie and, and, and Dan were talking about kind of in the heart of downtown here. Uh, and then you see this exodus to, um, the moving north and, and north of Ponce uh, near Piedmont Park and Virginia Highlands. Um, can you all talk about a little bit more about this exodus and the, the kind of maybe the wealth gap or generational gap of these two communities? This typically was the Temple crowd, um, the German Jewish community that came in the in the mid 1800s, late 1800s, and this is the community that came in the late 1800s, early 1900s. Um, can you? Um, share a little bit more about this exodus to Virginia Highlands, those neighborhoods, and, and what impact that had on those neighborhoods? Well, you, you really had, uh, uh, when they, the Jewish population moved to the north side, you really had uh, two areas of the north side. It was the north east side and the northwest. The, the more fluent uh, Sephardics lived in the northwest where the houses were uh, a lot more expensive. And, but the others uh, remain primarily in the Virginia Highlands area, Lenox Road area. And then the, uh, the Northwest was, was further up where, and that's where they were mostly populated. You, you, you rarely saw any Jewish families living uh, outside of this area that, you, that you're pointing out. Uh, and then of course, eventually, uh, then they started moving to Alpharetta, you know, to, to Cobb County. You never thought you'd see Jewish families, let alone a Jewish synagogue in Cobb County when they used to burn, the Ku Klux Klan used to burn crosses. And when you see all this, it's just amazing how far uh, Atlanta has come uh, in, in the years that uh, when I look back to remembering when I was little on Pryor Street, uh, they, I saw some Ku Klux Klan people marching and standing with my dad. It scared me to death, but uh, we, we've come a long way in the last hundred years. Wow. Yeah, I, I had a, I had read a report of the Klan doing a march, and this must have been in the mid 20s, actually, so it's earlier, but that they would march uh, south from downtown, I think either on Fraser or Martin Street, so that they were going straight through the center of Summer Hill to intimidate the Black community along Georgia Avenue and then back up north on, say, Pryor. Uh, to intimidate uh, Greeks um, and uh, Sephardic Jews and other Jews who were living around there. So it was sort of like a, a one-stop shop for 
clan uh, misbehavior. Uh, one of the things that's interesting, I think, about this map, Jeremy, that you're uh, showing us uh, is that, so it's part of this larger report about sort of the status of the Jewish population in Atlanta with very much a sort of a forward looking intent. And one of the things that the report says, you know, it's looking at, you know, the, the population trends and where people are and where, especially where children are, families with children, as opposed to uh, older people, as you mentioned, this is generation thing going on. And the uh, Federation is saying, we need to move all of the Jewish institutions out of the South side and onto the North side. Uh, and so I think that this points to a bit of a chicken and egg question that we are inevitably confronted with when we're thinking about historical change at all, right? Like, so what caused it? Um, was the move of uh, uh, you know, European uh, descended Jews uh, and other white people from the South to the North uh, caused by sort of like changes in the city, uh, changes in the way in where the suburbs are being built and particularly suburbs that were meant exclusively for white people? Um, or was it the move of uh, the Jewish individuals that sort of transformed the neighborhood? And I don't think that there's any one answer, right, to that question. I think it, it's, a, you know, it's a constantly sort of, it's a feedback loop. <laughs> and so uh, as the suburbs, I think it does start, I think it does start with sort of decisions that are being made by the city about where these more affluent uh, sort of park, beautiful park neighborhood suburbs with curvilinear streets and not built on a grid and where there aren't going to be any stores because stores were regarded as bad for a neighborhood, which is kind of the opposite of what we think now. Um, and also places where people can put their cars because this is the beginning of the, you know, the era of their people owning a car uh, in their, you know, for their private families. Uh, though all of those suburbs are being built to the north. And so those Jews who can afford to move to those neighborhoods do. And that, that's how we start to see people moving, sort of people of means um, moving out of those neighborhoods and sort of taking their, um, the resources that they, you know, their family resources, the taxes that they pay with them uh, to those Northern neighborhoods, sending their children to more affluent schools and so on. And so, uh, you know, institutions will follow suit, and then the members of those institutions who don't necessarily want to have to, you know, drive several miles every time they're going to temple will also move to the north, and then people will follow their communities, and then the neighborhood is transformed, and the the chicken and egg continues uh, to, you know, inform each other, continue to inform each other. So. I think, yeah, the story of how this neighborhood changed and the reason for this exodus to the north uh, is, you know, certainly not a foregone conclusion. Uh, I think that those who could move uh, and also who were interested in sending their children to schools in the north of the city, especially when there were so few high schools in the city, um, that, when, you know, once they could afford to, uh, they did. And the, as the south side of the city came to be regarded as uh, poorer uh, and often, you know, the, the black population was getting denser, uh, more white people would move out of those neighborhoods. This, you could see this kind of as an early iteration of white flight, I would say. But unfortunately, we're at time. Um, oh. if, uh, if you don't, have, if you didn't get, if we didn't get to your question, uh, please do reach out to us and we'll get you those answers. Uh, a couple of people were asking about pictures of AA and um, uh, also about a history of Ancha Safar, which we, we have in the archives at the Bremen. So reach out to our archive staff and we'll make sure to get that to you. Uh, thank you so much, Dan and Marnie, for sharing your really incredible map projects and, and, and highlighting this, this history of our community. Um, quick reminder to be on the lookout for a follow-up email from us uh, containing a link to an online survey, as well as it'll contain links to where you can learn more about these map projects that'll be coming to you shortly. And I hope that you can join us again next week as we discuss um, the life of Jewish politician Morse Abram uh, with biographer David Lowe, and it'll be moderated by Dr. Catherine Lewis. Uh, until then, everybody stay safe and we'll see you next week.